Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it is, my name is indeed uh, Martina Caterina, um, and I am the co-chair of the TAS team on law and policy of the Global Protection Cluster. And it is really a pleasure to be with all of you today for this important session uh, of the Global Protection Forum, as Natalie was saying, on strengthening legal aid and access to justice in humanitarian settings. Um, for those who do not know about our task team, uh, the task team was actually established a few years back as a global platform for coordination among humanitarian actors, but it also includes some human rights and development actors, including UN agencies, NGOs and uh, academia, uh, on law and policy engagement. And its objective has been to promote and support regular dialogue, experience sharing, and most importantly, action in this area. Uh, both in terms of law and policy development, uh, but also implementation of existing frameworks to ensure access to rights for people affected by humanitarian crises, including internally displaced persons. The focus on implementation is really what led us to focus our work on legal aid in humanitarian settings, you know, particularly through a project that my co-chair, Catherine, uh, will soon tell you a bit more about. But today, uh, we also have really the pleasure to launch a publication that we have developed over the past couple of years, working with many of you, um, a compilation of good practices, which uh, is one of the results of, of this project. But before we go into all of that, and we'll, we'll, we'll present our wonderful speakers today, um, with this, I just would like to give the floor for a few opening remarks uh, to Ms. Corita Tassi, who works with ECHO as thematic expert on protection and gender. And Corita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martina. Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome to this very important session. Um, uh, Legal aid is essential in humanitarian intervention. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to have these uh, few opening remarks. Um, because I'm a big fan of legal aid. <laughs> so um, legal aid is essential in humanitarian intervention and ensuring the centrality of protection throughout the humanitarian response, but also to support the affected population, um, not only in accessing justice, but also protection, humanitarian assistance and services. However, too often we see that legal aid is overlooked and not deemed as a priority during preparedness efforts and from the onset of a crisis. So first of all, um, my plea would be really um, an urgency for more attention to legally, a po uh, legal and policy related issues and the need to develop those within a comprehensive contextualized risk analysis. The risk analysis should remain at the core of the protection and broader humanitarian strategy. The analysis of the legal framework and national legislation remains a crucial component to identify and address context specific impediments and barriers for people to access and enjoy their rights. Secondly, we should reinforce evidence and interagency efforts. More data needs to be collected, more information needs to be analyzed, and more evidence needs to be developed about how deprioritized legal aid and the lack of incomplete or inadequate laws and policies actually affect the access and enjoyment of affected people's rights. And this has to be a collective effort and collective work that includes the support of all cluster members, but even beyond of all humanitarian actors and leadership. And finally, our old good friend, the Nexus, it remains absolutely essential and crucial to coordinate and join efforts with development actors and stakeholders. In this direction, the humanitarian actors have also a crucial role in analyzing the state of play and legal framework, or lack of it, building evidence-based advocacy and pushing towards change and monitoring it. But we all agree that governments have the primary responsibility in protecting their affected population. And so it remains crucial that the accompaniment of governments, the coordinating engagement of stakeholders at all levels, local, national, regional, and global, and the support to law and policy making processes is jointly supported with the development partners in order to find and achieve meaningful and sustainable solutions. So I'm sure this is just 
one step uh, on a long but rewarding process. And I really look forward to further working together on building better humanitarian intervention where affected population can overcome existing legal laws, of course, and access justice uh, uh, and enjoy their rights. So thank you very much. I look forward to the rich discussion and insightful presentations ahead. So over to you. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Corita, for these great opening remarks that uh, really usefully uh, helped us, you know, setting the scene for this conversation that we will have today. And indeed, you touched upon many of the important points that then our uh, colleagues will we will go back to in the in the respective presentations. So I think that this is just fantastic, and we're very happy to have a big uh, fan and supporter of these issues uh, like you in 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 our event today. So with this, I would like now to pass the floor to my TAS team co-chair, uh, Katrin uh, Ringele uh, from the Norwegian Refugee Council, who's uh, the global uh, ICLA advisor for NRC, um, to briefly present the project that the TAS team led on legal aid in humanitarian settings and some of the key takeaways from the publication uh, Strengthening Legal Aid and Access to Justice in Humanitarian Settings, a compilation of learning of relevant strategies and effective practices very long title <laughs> for this publication that we are uh, launching today that we, uh, through which we try to collect some of the learning uh, from this project. Um, and Katrin, the floor is yours and we can now share the screen with the presentation for Katrin. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Martina. And uh, yes, indeed, Corita, many of the things you have said, you will hear them resonating uh, in our report, in the recommendations, but also in the presentation status. So it seems we're we're having a good start and we are aligned in our messages, which is great. Um, yeah, next slide. So um, on the project, the project was started in 2021. Uh, and the main, the key overarching uh, objective was really uh, improving capacities of uh, field protection clusters, areas of responsibilities, uh, members and partners. And this to ensure we could do joint analysis of legal aid and access to justice uh, landscape in humanitarian or crisis settings. Also to better understand and assess the legal aid needs in the countries of operations. And in this way, ensuring that legal aid and access to justice is part of a wider, broader protection analysis. And lastly, inform a coordinated and collaborative action um, to address legal aid needs, but also gaps and promote relevant uh, legal aid interventions. Next slide. Uh, in this way, and here we go, uh, our friend, the Nexus Corita. So the project aims indeed to strengthen the humanitarian development peace nexus and making sure that access is recognized as central, a central element uh, in these different phases of the emergency. So from an emergency response to sustained recovery and all the way to contributing to durable solutions. And then lastly, of course, the project wanted also highlight best practices and learning at the national and regional level uh, to promote effective action. Next slide, please. The project. The project had different phases. So we started, of course, with the creating of the necessary tools. Uh, that was first a conceptual framework. Uh, and then uh, what we call the LAF, which is our legal aid analysis framework, uh, which was accompanied by a guidance note. And uh, this was there to facilitate comprehensive assessment of legal aid landscapes in a given country or a territory affected by a crisis. And a third uh, product that was created in that first phase was a survey report on legal aid and access to justice in crisis settings, which focuses, focused on policy, coordination, partnerships, funding and field needs. Then the second phase was started somewhere uh, September 2022, and this then consisted in dissemination and deployment of the toolkits and the approaches. And this was done through training, through pilots, uh, and through uh, technical support on coordinated initiatives in various countries. Uh, once this whole phase of dissemination was over, we really started with uh, making sure the tool was being used in different field settings. And alongside this implementation of the tool, the use of the tool, the task team also tried to capture learning from the implementation and this uh, through the organization of several webinars, for example. 
And then lastly, this is where we are ending up today. As Martina said, we finally have managed to create our report or a publication, which is a compilation of good practices that we want to share with you today a little bit more in detail. And so um, this report, as we've seen, we started in 2021. So it's uh, quite a way back and it's, it's a rich uh, compilation based on a lot of consultations that were done at the start with humanitarian development, human rights and peace actors uh, that all work around legal aid and access to justice and also uh, collective learning that resulted from the many exchanges, the reflections uh, from among legal aid and access to to justice experts and practitioners working in, in a variety of crisis settings. So through all these voices, so to speak, the report aims to enrich global learning and promote relevant action in the crucial sphere of humanitarian development and peace response. The report uh, or the publication exists in like three chapters or three parts. So the first part is a bit of a background, elaborating background of the project and the legal aid and humanitarian setting um, yeah, uh, project. The second part is then the compilation of the findings. So this includes common challenges and good practices that are organized around three themes, so to speak, coordination, partnerships, and access to hard to reach population. And this chapter really underscores the complexities uh, and obstacles inherent to delivering such legal aid services, particularly in countries affected by conflict and with fragile governance structures. Um, in terms of good practices, uh, there is really a lot there, a series of effective legal aid and access to justice practices um, and initiatives that have been identified by many of you on the call, many of our field colleagues, uh, and these have uh, demonstrated to have a positive impact on those impacted by crisis. And these are also organized around these similar teams, coordination, partnership, and um, hard to reach populations. And then our last chapter is, uh, maybe we can call it recommendations, but it pre presents kind of practical uh, guidance for practitioners in the field to develop relevant and transformative legal aid and access to justice strategies and interventions. And this all, of course, is based uh, on the evidence that is presented in part two. So it's a bit our concluding chapter. Now, looking at those practical guidance or the recommendations, they are kind of um, organized around four elements or four key principles that we think are uh, or should be considered to be uh, necessary in order to create a sound legal uh, access to justice and legal aid uh, strategies. Um, so those four are on the next slides. Uh, the first one is um, a theory of change that, of course, responds to identified legal aid uh, or legal protection needs, but at the same time also contributing or reflecting the ad addressing uh, root causes of crisis. Um, the second element is really ensuring that uh, legal aid and access to justice is at the core of the protection response in order to co uh, contribute to sustainable objectives. The third element looks into um, how we need to be carefully defining target groups and justice seekers and agents of change to ensure um, uh, people-centered and inclusive approaches. And then lastly, uh, we are talking about um, uh, adequate, localized and innovative approaches um, uh, in order to design uh, as, as best as possible. Um, now, we will hear uh, from several colleagues who will be presenting after me uh, some concrete examples of what this might look like in, in practice, good, good practice and strategies. But before that, we wanted to go over or highlight some of the key recommendations in the report. We can't go over all of it, but we have picked and choose to give you a bit of an idea what that last chapter is in terms of recommendations looks like. So I'll, I'll highlight uh, some of um, some elements on each of those four key uh, principles that we spoke about. Um, so on the first one, uh, we're talking about this idea of the theory of change that is, uh, next slide, uh, needed into uh, identify or uh, respond to identified legal aids and uh, legal protection needs, but at the same time that link to addressing root causes. So it is important that there is this analysis of root causes being done uh, in order to in 
use that in the design uh, and ensure sustainable justice solutions. That also means then that we're looking into structural drivers that lead to forced displacement as well as structural barriers that might prevent displaced populations to access remedies or justice. Um, this also means understanding the broader access to justice landscape, as this can uh, provide multi or can multiply the effects and impacts uh, that legal aid programs uh, have for displaced peoples and beyond. And of course, then this links back to the tool that we spoke about at the start, our legal aid and analysis framework that will help to undertake such a legal aid and access to justice analysis from a justice landscape or a systems perspective. Uh, next slide, uh, a bit of the second element, uh, all related to this idea of how uh, legal aid and access to justice is really core to our protection response or the humanitarian development uh, peace uh, interventions or response. Um, and it comes back again to understanding the legal landscape within protection analysis uh, often or helps us revealing how legal factors are also linked or contribute to risks. Um, so you have a protection anal analytical uh, anal analytical framework, the PAF, uh, and so it's here how the PAF and the LOF, as we say, come together. So really making sure that that analysis part from a legal perspective is is done within a broader protection analysis, as there are uh, links between legal factors and protection risks. Um, and so. Um, it is also important, uh, the other aspect to this is that other humanitarian uh, development and peace actors integrate this legal aid dimension or legal dimension to their sectoral priorities. And this uh, integration serves kind of a double purpose. So the first one could be said is, is good programming, is ensuring that sectoral interventions, think about shelter, think about livelihoods, are aligned with um, legal and policy frameworks of the particular country or territory they're working in. But also, secondly, uh, it will help to address uh, justice issues uh, faced by affected populations that otherwise are not reached by protection intervention. And maybe a quick example, think about shelter interventions. It will be essential to conduct an analysis of housing, land and property frameworks um, and as well as HLP rights so that we understand how are these rights impacted, how could they be safeguarded and how could they potentially be restored. Um, and then uh, next slide, talking about inclusive and particip participatory approaches. So um, the whole of population approach, so making sure that legal aid and access to justice interventions should be designed uh, with a comprehensive understanding of the diverse needs of crisis affected populations, as well as host communities. Um, and that this whole of population approach also includes and in developing an understanding of existing capacities and responses to resolve justice problems. So it's looking when we talk about inclusivity, the, the populations we work with, uh, their capacities, their needs, and at the same time also capacities within the system, uh, systems, the system, the justice system, um, and uh, look at, at both ways uh, to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, the other effects or the other issue that we need to speak about here that came up is then um, compounded vulnerability. So uh, particular individuals and groups could experience uh, interconnected vulnerabilities. Uh, think about we are not just women or we're not just men, but we are belonging to different groups. We might have different legal status. So all of these issues will then lead to unique challenges that groups are facing. Uh, and it's important to take that into consideration. Um, this might involve then directly engaging with co engaging community members in the provision of legal aid services because for their own peers, for example. Additionally, it also often, of course, requires collaboration with customer informal justice actors, as well as a broad range of non-legal actors to be able to uh, serve the different needs. And then uh, women participation can play a pivotal role. Uh, and this access should be promoted through all potential or possible avenues of justice, including uh, plural legal uh, justice systems. And then the last part, um, the last element or principle we talked about talks uh, a bit around localization, generally localized uh, approaches and innovative approaches. 
Um, a couple of points here. Uh, one is uh, what is really important is when you think about uh, programming is, is a combination of interventions, advocacy and policy initiatives. The one are connected to the other and, and are needed in order to provide effective and adequate responses. Um, collaboration, of course, with national and local justice actors is, is essential in order to uh, ensure effective and sustainable interventions. This includes uh, customary and informal justice systems or actors. Um, and then maybe the last thing I will say, because time is running, um, we have, of course, the use of technology uh, in order to be uh, uh, data for innovation, but also targeted interventions. And then uh, important that legal aid and justice interventions are built around multidisciplinary teams. Think about quality, uh, qualified lawyers, but also paralegals and social workers. Um, so I'll keep it uh, to this. Uh, many more to find in the report. Uh, so please have a look at it. But also uh, would be really interesting to have these uh, principles and elements, good practices come to life in the presentations that come, uh, be, that come now. So over to you, Martina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, really well done. Great work for summarizing uh, all of that uh, in about 10 minutes. So um, very rich. And uh, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge it is so great to see everybody introducing themselves and see a lot of friends and colleagues uh, uh, that, are, that are joining us today for this event. So um, yeah, just, just really a pleasure. And now we are very lucky to have with us today um, for speakers, for colleagues that are doing really excellent work in this area, um, often in very challenging contexts, and we really look forward to hearing from them offering, as Catherine was saying, some of the concrete examples of lessons learned that we have also tried to capture in this uh, compilation. Um, we will, I will introduce them one by one uh, when it's their turn to speak. Um, so now we will start from uh, Lorena Nieto. Uh, the Senior Protection Cluster Coordinator in Northwest Syria. Lorena, it is a great pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, we have talked about legal aid. Uh, we heard from Corita from the beginning as a key area of protection and humanitarian work more broadly, uh, and about the importance of coordination in this area. So among humanitarian actors, just as much as between humanitarian and human rights and development actors. So could you please tell us more about the work in this area of the protection clusters and the AORs in the context of Northwest Syria? Um, what have your efforts been to bring about more effective, coordinated and collaborative legal aid interventions that aim at securing the rights of people affected by humanitarian crisis? And um, thank you very much. The floor is yours, Lorena. Thank you, Martina. And thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so the situation, just to start uh, on a very, very short background, when we talk about Northwest Syria, just to place it on everybody's radar, we are talking about uh, a, a specific area within Syria, uh, in the border with uh, Turkey, but also with Iraq. Um, where we are with a de facto authority situation after the war. And we are talking about 5.1 people that are living in Northwest. So just to connect also with the previous findings that were uh, shared on the study, our approach on the legal strategy, and this is something that we developed last year, uh, previously in Northwest, there was no legal strategy in place. And this was connected to, I believe, one of the key um, ways of approaching the provision of legal aid in humanitarian settings, which is understood as something that comes later on. I mean, when we talk about life savings, there is a misconception of legal is something that you can address in a, in a later on phase, but not at the beginning of the situation. So one of the things that we started to discuss with our partners, if we can move to the next slide, was what was the rationale behind the approach on legal aid? And this is for us very important. Uh, partners were under the impression, and we are talking about 110 organizations that we have as partners in Northwest Syria, that uh, legal is something that is too sensitive. Donors don't approve, don't support legal approaches. Uh, and more and less likely when we are talking areas where we have uh, de facto authorities. So this was the first kind of wall that we had to address and discuss with our partners. And the discussion was, we know partners are providing legal aid, 
they are not reporting on that because they believe the cluster and the donors are going to push back. And what we said is if we change the approach, if we standardize the approach, it will create a safety net for all the partners in order to be able to provide these services. So it was a first step on how to guarantee that we had the same approach on how the provision of legal aid should be done in Northwest Syria that allowed us to prevent closure of the humanitarian space and at the same time prevented some of the partners from being exposed in front of armed fractions or uh, de facto authorities. Then we also discussed that legal services, legal aid, access to justice is not something that belongs to one specific area. And we said we need to guarantee that the provision of legal services is going to be embedded across the structure of the protection cluster, which means it includes the GBBAUR, the CPAUR, the Mine Action AUR, and of course the HLP uh, AUR. By doing this, we started to draft the guidance note for the partners and agreed with the different AURs, which were the specific areas in which they have seen that the provision of legal services was able to increase the impact of the service. To give you an example, when we talked about the GBBAUR, we knew that, for example, on GBB-related response, domestic violence, the provision of legal services was key to guarantee increased protection for the survivor. So we said we need to connect that. When we talked with the CPAUR, issues of, for example, uh, guardianship needed to have legal support to prevent exposure of children to additional protection risks. So it was an integrated discussion and the strategy that we developed for the partners is in connection and agreement with the different AORs. Um, we also agreed that when we provide legal aid, it cannot be perceived as a service. We understood that when we are providing legal support, is also trying to enhance the engagement of communities with the rule of law. One of the key factors for Northwest is that there has been no rule of law for many decades in the Syrian society. In order to be able to move forward, to rebuild their society, to rebuild and to be able to, to build peace later on, communities have to understand what the rule of law means. And it starts with the basics of understanding why do I need to have a civil documentation? Why do I need to have birth registration for my children? Why do I need to understand what the legal access means and how to do that? So it is also related to legal aid is not a service that is provided. Legal aid is what is helping us build up the sense of rule of law and the engagement of communities with something concrete that is not as abstract as talking about the rule of law as something that cannot be touched or is written in the documents. It is the application of the access to legal services that will lead communities to have a better understanding what the rule of law means, even if they are living in de facto context. The next step of this rational approach was we need to target in the nexus that Corita was referring to at the beginning of the session. We said the provision of legal aid, access to justice, is not something that is only within the scope of one of the phases of displacement meaning is not only about emergencies, is not only about protection, it has to go through all the phases of displacement. So it means that we need to guarantee that IDPs and host communities have access to provision of legal support, even if they are newly displaced, if they are in a protected situation or to secure access to transitional justice mechanisms. So the provision of legal services has to go through all the different stages of displacement. It is a connection also with the human rights space. I think that uh, one of the main challenges that the discussion on legal aid has is when people start to wonder, are you going into development? Isn't this something that human rights organizations are supposed to do? Why humanitarian actors have to do this? And we approach these discussions several times with protection partners explaining there isn't a division between one and two. Everything that we do is human rights based. So it means that we have an obligation to guarantee that the fulfillment of rights is not only done through the provision of services, it has to be through the strengthening of the protection environment and rule of law and access to justice is within that obli obligation that we have to strengthen the protection environment. Finally, and connecting with the sustainability of the interventions, 
everything that we do on this process of enhancing rule of law in Northwest Syria has to be a commitment for the mid to longer term. And the only way to do that, right now what we have is pool funds and all the pool funds are between six to nine months. So we agreed with partners that we needed to have consortium approach where we were seeking from the donors multi-year support. And this is what we started to do back uh, by the end of last year. And now we have two consortiums in place that we are, inshallah, getting the support from the donors for 2025. There are some initial commitments, but within both consortiums, one for emergency preparedness and protection response, and the other one for rule of law and transitional justice, in both of them, we have included the provision of legal support as one of the main activities that we need to find support with in the next two, three years. Next. So this was more on the strategic approach. I just wanted to show you where we are on this legal network. So we rolled out the legal strategy. We did the advocacy with all the partners to understand why we needed to do this and why this is not for human rights people. That is not us. Um, and what we said is, oh, every single proposal by the end of 2023 and 2024 won't be accepted in the HRP or for the pool funds if it doesn't include the provision of legal support. So that created a wave that was very important for us because it allowed us to have a legal network in place where we have currently 125 lawyers, 62 of them are men, women, sorry, 63 of them are men. It's not six, I'm sorry, the map is uh, covering the figure, but it's 62, 63. Overall, we have 20, uh, 125 uh, lawyers in Northwest Syria, and these lawyers are providing all these services. So just to give you an example, when we are talking of uh, a recent displacement, we have partners that are doing uh, registration of abandoned property. I connect also with the findings that were presented, the importance of including house, land, and property within this provision. So we have partners that are helping us register abandoned property or property that was affected by uh, the war, bombing, shelling, or whatever. Uh, in the protection uh, response, we are doing these integrated uh, services for issues that go from HRP-related claims into inheritance, into guardianship, divorces, civil documentation, bad registration, divorce registration, and so forth. And also connected to transitional justice, we are doing two things that were mentioned in the findings of the report. One is the documentation of rights violations for future transitional justice mechanisms. The second one is the safeguarding of ownership documentation for the restitution of house, land and property, again, when the transitional justice mechanisms are in place. With this legal network that we have now in place, between January and September, we have been able to reach uh, 62,000 people, and we have been able to secure uh, $2.9 uh, million, which is only 8% of the overall secure funds. But before this legal strategy, we had 1% of the overall uh, funds for the protection cluster were to legal. Now we have increased from one to eight in one year, which we believe is, is, is pretty good. We, we understand the magnitude is much more higher and we are trying to see whether we can get the support from the donors in this consortium uh, that we are doing right now. We wanted to also mention um, how the situation in the frontline areas is, because of course, many of these access or provision of legal support is focused on the reception areas. What you see on the uh, darkest blue is the areas, the frontline areas that we have. And as you see, in those areas is we are where we are providing the legal support. So there is a combination of uh, exercises. One, for the frontline areas with absence of uh, security conditions, we have outreach teams that are moving to the frontline areas to guarantee there is a basic provision of legal services, mainly on civil documentation to guarantee that if people displace, at the very least they have documents to move without being exposed to additional risks. In the reception areas, we have 62 community centers with the partners, and these community centers are where IDPs are arriving to guarantee they are provided with integrated provision of services, including the legal support. And the final uh, aspect in which we have embedded this legal capacity is in agreement with some partners that are more health focused, 
there has been the establishment of protection teams within health facilities to guarantee two things. One, the people that are going to access health services and are in need of protection services, included uh, legal support, are referred within the same health facility to get access to these services. And that also allow us to do uh, the health people are doing uh, the identification of rights violations, then the documentation is done, and then the provision of services is also done. So we are trying to make sure that if we have documentation of rights, it is also connected to the provision of immediate legal support that is needed. In the graphic that you see above the map is just to show you the kind of services that were requested in this January to August uh, from the legal partners. You see that most of the requests were linked to ID card because there are many different procedures for civil documentation in Northwest Syria, and you can not move between Northern Aleppo and Idlib without specific documents. Uh, birth registration is the second one. The third one is marriage registration. And then you also see that we have purchase and sale of HLP assets. Next. And this is with this I end. We wanted to just highlight some issues on lessons learned. The first one is that Many times we hear that uh, legal is too sensitive. And the approach that we have done with our partners is when we identify something that it seems to be very sensitive, it doesn't mean that we cannot do it. It means that we need to talk more and coordinate better and articulate better to guarantee that when we do it together, we are stronger and we are not exposing anybody. So if it is sensitive, we just need to find a way to do it. And it implies that we need to do it together. If we do it in a siloed manner, then it becomes very risky. So this is, I believe, a lesson learned. The second one, as I already mentioned, is that when we talk about access to justice, it includes all AORs and the PC. It cannot be a siloed issue for the age of the AOR. It has to be connected to the overall protection structure. One of the lessons learned that we had was if we do provision of legal services, we need to guarantee provision of cash. At least in the case of Northwest Syria, that became a huge issue. When we did the survey of what people needed on the legal front, many of the gaps were related to people not having money to pay for stamps, to pay for fees, to pay for copies. And when we were doing the calculation of that, it was less than $1 that they, don't, they didn't have. So it turned into not having documentation, not doing by registration. So we said it didn't make any sense. So we included cash for legal with a specific uh, fees matrix for both governorates. So it's not giving money like crazy people. It is standardized for all the partners. We have ceilings. We know the rounds in which the money can be uh, given. And also we developed a legal package that includes the guidance, includes the fees matrix, includes the way to provide cash for legal. So adding cash is essential for the provision of legal services. Uh, I will jump into this intersectorial because it was also mentioned by the findings of the of the of the report that you were mentioning. Uh, all of the things that we are doing have to be connected to the rest of the clusters. Uh, when we are talking about due diligence, for example, we cannot do that without CCCM and shelter. When we are talking about uh, rights violations, it has to be connected to the health cluster and many other clusters. So uh, we have set this capacity on technical support on legal across the, the clusters to guarantee that any legal related needs come back to the HLP AOR and we provide those services across the different clusters. Finally, we developed a legal dashboard that you, it's already in the link because we understand that for donors, legal might be something mm, kind of, mm, is too abstract. What is the impact? If we have to decide between blankets and legal, then we go for the blankets because it's concrete. Are you paying for lawyers? What is the impact of that? So one of the key issues is if we are advocating for provision of legal support, it has to be visible. We have to show the impact of that. We have to, the information that we have in the dashboard that we are collecting from our legal partners come on a monthly basis. And we are asking what the legal actions are, what is the distribution, which are the population groups that are accessing these services, where do we have the gaps, how much time is requested from the legal partners to resolve a case. So 
Yes, I mean, I believe donors are interested on the legal support, but I believe that we need to step up our capacity to show the impact of legal and to show the comprehensive um, way in which he, it addresses the root causes and it concretely prevents exposure to additional protection risks. I will leave it at that to commit with the time and thank you very much everybody for listening. Over to you, Martina. Thank you very much, Lorena. I mean, really so interesting. Uh, you also very helpfully summarized everything in the last slides, so we not even try, but there is so much that I take with me from what you've just said. Um, congratulations, I would say, to you and all the partners for the progress that you have made, despite all the challenges, because it is really very impressive, and I hope uh, we'll make sure to have also the link to the dashboard in the chat uh, so the colleagues can have a look. Um, we'll get back to you during the Q&A, but now next, uh, we'd like to hear from Mr. Babakura, uh, Access to Justice Project Coordinator from the Nigerian Bar Association. And uh, yes, Baba, we will see in case there is a, an issue with your, with your video, but as long as we can hear you loud and clear, that, that's the important part. So thank you so much, Baba, for being with us today in the report. Of course, we talk a lot about, as Catherine was saying, about the importance of coordination and partnerships with national and local actors that are working in this area. So could you please tell us more about the work of the Nigerian Bar Associations in Northeast Nigeria to support legal aid interventions for people affected by humanitarian crisis? And how do you work with other members of the protection sector to ensure more effective, uh, coordinated and collaborative action in this area. Thank you. And over to you, Baba. We can hear you if you can try to speak up a bit. Hello, am I audible? Yes, better. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Baba Kurakaka. I'm the coordinator of Access to Justice Project of the Nigerian Bar Association in Borno State, Northeast Nigeria. Uh, the project is on the providing free legal services to persons that were affected by the Boko Haram insurgency in Northeast Nigeria, particularly the state of Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe. So the project is virtually uh, divided into two. That is the legal assistance and also uh, the documentation. So can we go to the uh, next slide? Yes, as I said, it's in Northeast Nigeria, Borno Yobe and Adamawa. These are the three states that we cover. But in all, we are covering 22 uh, local government areas you know, of those uh, states, but largely is in Bordeaux state where the impact of the insurgency is uh, very much or is uh, too high. So the project is actually aimed at uh, assisting the internally displaced persons. This is the main project, but we also look at other uh, people that cross into Nigeria for whatever reasons uh, or affected by the uh, insurgency and also people that have returned back to Nigeria after crossing the international border to other countries like Niger, Chad or, or Cameroon. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, uh, the project uh, is aimed at achieving a lot of things, as I said, we have the legal assistance and also the documentation. So under the legal assistance, we have uh, cases of representation in court. The MBA assigned lawyers to represent those people who have cases uh, in court. We also have a session for ADR, that is uh, alternative dispute resolution, to assist uh, these uh, people. Then we also have uh, a probate matters that is later of administration. It's more of a probate where uh, these uh, affected people have access or will have access to the estate left behind 
by their VVs are relative, either being a husband, father, mother, brothers, and, and other uh, relatives. So here we assist them in obtaining, applying and obtaining a letter of administration so that they can have access to their estate of their loved ones, particularly money in bank, access to real estate like land, and also uh, they can follow up and obtain uh, a debt benefit or gratification from the employers of the, of the deceased, either government employer or a private uh, company. Then still we also, after the establishment of various camps in the safe area like Meduguri, so people are finding it very difficult to come out from those camps to uh, attend their court cases. So uh, we jointly, in collaboration with our, uh, our donor, that is the UNHCR, uh, a mobile court was established in some camps where these people are easily assessing justice through these uh, mobile camps, I mean mobile court that were established uh, in the in the camp. Then we also have a legal session or legal counseling where lawyers do go to those camps and also listen to people, give them some legal advice and legal uh, counseling. So for cases that could not go to court, but in the process of counseling, if it is over that there's a need for legal intervention in court, then the case will be referred to courts. So also uh, detention center like police stations, the military detention center and so on, lawyers do visit and also attend to uh, these people that were detained for uh, some reasons. And then on that is under uh, legal services. Then other activities though not captured here is uh, legal awareness through radio and television programs were also being uh, established and we assist them through uh, this media. So telling them if you have legal problem, this is what you do, this is where you go, this is how you can solve your problem and so on and so forth through the radio and even for other uh, social media. Then under documentation, under documentation, there is a birth certificate. Then in Nigeria, we have what we call uh, indigent certificate, which is issued by the local government uh, authority, you not know, the state or the federal. So this indigent certificate is a certificate given by the local government to the indigent of those local government to establish their indigenship and it helped them to secure admissions in school. It helped them to procure some other travel document. It helped them to secure uh, employment from the government. It helped them to secure uh, scholarship from the government and other philanthropists and also uh, politicians. So we assist them in in collaboration with the local government concern, then we assist them in printing and give them this uh, indigenous uh, certificate. Then we also collaborate with the National Population Commission of Nigeria, or Borno State, Yobe, and Adama in assisting the registration of, of children below the age of 17. Yeah. It is free. So we give them the birth certificate there, then register them and also give them the birth certificate. Then this year, we also commence uh, NIN registration. This is also an important uh, aspect of documentation in Nigeria. NIN stands for National Identification uh, Number, which is also linked to uh, bank account, it will also link to mobile phone, and it will also link to passport and other, to other important uh, documents. So without this NIN, it is very difficult to people to access some social uh, services in Nigeria. 
So we also register and give them the national ID card, including the NIN, including those who have uh, returned back to Nigeria uh, from Cameroon, like this year, there are some repatriation from Cameroon, Minawai, from Cameroon. We went there in the Bunchi town and assist them in getting all these uh, necessary uh, documents. So virtually these are the activities that we carry out in Northeast Nigeria in assisting uh, those who are affected by the insurgency. So the number there are the number of persons that we assisted for this year, not for the previous years. Actually, we started this program around 2017 when we fully entered into partnership with the UN UNHCR. So can we go to the next slide, please? Next. Yes. So among other activities, including our advocacy visit, we do paid advocacy visit to authorities, so that the, the judiciary, the local government authorities, the police, FIDA, and traditional rulers. So this uh, advocacy visit, we advocate for the authorities that this is what is supposed to be done, this is what is not supposed to be done, this is what we want, this is what the people are expected to have, this is what we intend to do. You can give us access to do that, access to do this. So this resulted in we have uh, free access to police stations, detention facilities, the prison detention facilities. We are the destitute, less privileged, and that were arrested or detained for some offenses which they have not committed or which they committed a less offense, but they were tagged with a very uh, big offense, and so on and so forth. Then, and also, uh, and of course, sitting even after the closure of camps. So, so some of these camps, the conventional camps in Meduguri have been closed. And the mobile court that I said earlier, which was established in those camps, were also uh, supposed to be closed. But we advocated that this mobile court to continue sitting within the Meduguri in assistance or fast tracking cases that are. Uh, involve the internally uh, displaced displaced person. Sorry. Then also, this advocacy meeting resulted in sitting of court in some liberated areas. So there are some areas in the LGS that were liberated from the insurgency by the Nigerian army, and civil authority returned, but there are no courts. So we advocate for that and court of commence sitting in some of these uh, locations, though not without challenges. There is a lot of challenges, like the court buildings are completely destroyed or dilapidated. There is uh, a residence for court, there are security issues, and so on, and so forth, even transportation, mm. and so on. But at least uh, something has been done, and what have Women sitting in some of these uh, liberated uh, LGS like Momono, Damasak, Bama, Goza, Adabo, uh, and so on. Then also advocacy uh, visit to the government institute, which resulted in continuing issuance of uh, legal documentation that I have explained earlier the birth certificate, the indigent certificate, and recently the national ID card and NIN. And we go to the next slide. Baba, yes. allow me, sorry, just to say that you have about three more minutes, if that's okay, because we still yeah. have a few presentation and the mentimeter. Okay, Thank you no so problem. much. No problem. But then legal counseling and awareness, I think I have talked about this on um, problem matters. We go to the camps and other host community and also to the radio presentation. On and give them awareness on all those legal matters, like human rights, matrimonial inheritance, criminal matters, and so on. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next. Yes, uh, there is a collaborative effort with uh, other NGOs like the NRC, DRC, and 
national human rights commissions who also uh, implement some uh, activities that are related to uh, access to justice, which we usually collaborate with them in implementing uh, such uh, activities. Yes, can we go to next slide? Next. Yes, what is the impact of this uh, project? Yes, actually it has increased access to legal documentation, increased awareness of formal rights and procedure of enforcing evaluations of these formal rights. People are now aware of it. it reduce arbitrariness by the security agency because of the constant advocacy, constant awareness and training uh, for these uh, agencies that is uh, actually reduced in uh, arbitrary uh, detention and so on, increase to access to legal services by forcibly displaced persons. So because of the advocacy, we caught up now sitting in some of these liberated areas. People are now aware of what to do in legal matter and how can they do it and so on. So these are some of the impact of the project. Can we go? Next, next slide. Yes, uh, despite all these achievements and all what has been done, this does not mean that we don't have uh, challenges. We have numerous hundred and one uh, challenges uh, in in implementing the project. Anything that has to do with uh, security and violence, actually there's a uh, challenges. So all these are the challenges. Most people are concerned with food, shelter, and medicine that pursue legal uh, matters. Government also usually uh, divert fund in providing food, medicine, and so on, than uh, building court or prisons, and so on and so forth. Uh, lack of confidence and delay in matters is also uh, major challenges. Uh, court were destroyed, police station were destroyed by these uh, insurgencies, so court have uh, difficulty in sitting. Then this uh, disruption of evidence in investigation of some of these uh, crime committed is uh, very difficult. Uh, lack of visiting the scene of crime, difficulty in assessing witness, and so on. Disruption of what I said about it. Then lack of human resources. Uh, people are not willing to go to the liberated area to work. And so it's very uh, difficulties in that. Then in some areas, you we used to face a uh, denial of accessing detention facility, particularly from the ministry, also uh, from the military. It's also a uh, little bit uh, challenges. So can we go to the next slide? Okay. Next. So there are some sort of uh, suggestions for that. Establishing a coordinating system among the implementing personal provision of quality and quantitative justice administration employing that is by employing competent and uh, judicial staff, establishment of more court operational services in the liberated area, and location and posting of court and court staff and police station in some of these uh, area, increasing legal awareness among the IDFs, adequate application of the law and enforcement of court judgment. Confidence is to restore confidence in the uh, the justice uh, system. Referral of cases to appropriate authorities at the time when it happens, so it will help in gathering the evidences and witnesses. Then enhancing the rule of law, proactive measure in reducing stigmatization of crime survival like SDBB. So there is a need for greater awareness of this. On. Can we go to next? That is next. the final slide. Baba. Okay, that is the final slide. Okay, thank you very much for your time and for your listening. Uh, we are very much great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Baba, for sharing the experience of the Nigerian Bar Association as a really an important protection partner that works in this area. It was very insightful to hear all, all your comments. I was. Um, 
I was just taking, you know, some notes and saying, but really the, the collaboration that you had described with all the different authorities, the local government units, the, the National Human Rights Commission, uh, the importance of all the interventions that you have described, also in addition to the legal services as such, but also looking at the importance of your advocacy activities with partners to, to bring the, that system change. I think that the, the nexus has become very much alive uh, when, when listening to you. Um, and now, before we go to the next presentation, we just wanted to hear from our audience, which is why now a Mentimeter question should appear on the screen. Um, and we have two questions uh, for you at this point. Um, the first one, um, it is like to get to know you a little bit better to understand to what extent uh, your work relates to legal aid and access to justice. So here it goes. Um, and you have two options uh, to have two options to respond. The link has been shared in the chat to the Mentimeter. So you can do that. Or you can also go to menti.com and use the code on the screen. But the first question is how important is uh, legal aid within the work of your organization? So the options are very much so, um, a little, uh, somehow relevant, not at all, or you're not sure, or you do not know. And while people reply, this is just to say that we will share the presentations, um, the presentation uh, that we are using today in the, in the event page at the end that will be made available to everyone. Um, so, yeah, we'll see, thanks to those that have replied so far. So we can see that this is, uh, the numbers are still going up, but the, it seems like uh, legal aid uh, is a relevant area of work for, for, for most of you. And so, which is, which is great. Um, and so understanding this, and we do not know for sure actually whether all of you are also members of protection clusters in your respective uh, areas of operation or not, um, we'll leave just another minute as I see that the instructions are still also coming in the chat. But we have a second question for you, um, which looks at so we have heard, uh, we've heard from Corita, we've heard from other speakers uh, that very often um, legal aid is not really prioritized in the, in the uh, you know, the interagency level. Uh, although we've also heard what uh, uh, Lorena and the protection cluster in Northwest Syria, you know, how they went about uh, solving this particular issue, which was very, very interesting. But now we have a question for you that looks at do you feel the legal aid work was prioritized in the latest HNO HRP process uh, in your respective country of operation? Um, and the answers here for you are very much so. It's been prioritized. It's been prioritized a little uh, somehow. It's not at all, or perhaps you, you are not sure or you do not know. So we'd love, again, uh, you can click in the chat. Okay. Uh, may I ask, uh, for those who said that it's been prioritized highly, could you perhaps indicate which country you are from? Sorry, I see that in the chat. That would be very interesting to, to hear. Maybe you are from Northwest Syria, <laughs> which is great, or maybe from another country that would be it would be very interesting to hear. Ukraine, mm -hmm. excellent, not for Syria. So this is where it's been prioritized a lot. That's great. Somalia, Nigeria, oh, this, this is, it's excellent. It's great to see 
it, it's great to see um, some of the, the like the, the answer some of these are expected somehow. And we know that, for example, in some of this area, exactly like in Ukraine, we have a legal aid working group working specifically on this um, in other countries. Very good. So, and we, so overall, a little, it's been prioritized a little. I think that this is, uh, it, it, it's great. This gives us an indication on how we can all collectively work towards, you know, uh, perhaps getting it a bit more prioritized uh, along the lines of what Lorena was also describing moving forward. So thank you so much, uh, colleagues. We now have uh, our um, next presenter. Uh, we are, it's a pleasure to introduce Stefano Consiglio, Program Officer for IDLO, the International Development Law Organization. Stefano, when we talk about access to justice, and of course we talk about different systems to ensure access to justice and to reach those that have a variety of legal needs in humanitarian settings. And so in this context, of course, we cannot overlook the importance of customary and informal justice system. So could I please ask you uh, to tell us a little bit more about this and about how IDLO works in this area to, adv to advance the rights of people affected by humanitarian crisis? Thank you, Stefano, and to you for 10 minutes, maybe nine. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Martina. I'll try to keep it brief. And just to say that all the speakers before me were actually mentioning in one way or another CIJ actors, and this makes my presentation actually much easier. Katrin uh, was mentioning the role of traditional actors in legal aid provision. Baba referred to the role of CIJ actors in Nigeria. Both Corita and Lorena highlighted the need to to promote holistic approaches that, that actually foster locally driven and locally owned solutions. And this is exactly the focus of this presentation, the alternative dispute resolution centers in Somalia, um, which are a locally born solution for which I would basically try to showcase three best practices. Um, and these are captured actually at page uh, page 36 and onwards of, of the report indicated by, by Martina. So if we could go to the first uh, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, so moving to the actual presentation, before explaining the functioning of the ADR centers, I thought it was important to to briefly mention the status of the justice sector in Somalia. Um, Somalia is characterized by a plural justice system, like many other countries, which combines customary law, uh, known as Kher, Sharia, uh, Italian civil law, and British common law. Now, during the war, public institutions were really severely damaged, and Somali communities relied primarily on the strength and durability of the Kher system. Since the federal government was established or refunctioning as of 2012, the country has focused on political stabilization and tried to really strengthen formal justice institutions. But in any case, these institutions still face limited capacity, challenging working condition, and a general lack of resources. And as a result, much of the population, and here we're speaking about 80, even 90% in certain areas, continue to rely on CIJ systems. Also, these systems, of course, are not without challenges. Uh, their procedures can fall short of international human rights standards, especially for women, marginalized groups, minority clans, IDPs. And additionally, they vary across region and really lack, in, in, in certain instances, formal integration with the state, which limits their enforceability. Now, it's against this background that for several years, um, IDLO and other development partners have been supporting the, the government of Somalia to establish these this ADR centers. But let me tell you what are these ADR centers and how do they work? So the centers directly provide justice through processes that incorporate elements of conventional ADR. So here we're speaking about mediation and arbitration, while also maintaining the alignment with Kher and Sharia, which are the sources of law. Um, in each center, disputes are settled by a panel of adjudicators, which are identified by the ministries of justice in consultation with community leaders, elders, sheikhs, women leaders, IDPs. The idea is to promote inclusiveness, and we'll speak about it in a second. Each ADR center has a roster of 10 adjudicators, one clerk, and one community paralegal. The ADR clerk is responsible for daily administration of the center. So this is case recording, maintaining working relationship with other community actors, especially district court and police officers, and notably for cases of referral. 
Um, there's then an ADR community paralegal that supports the ADR clerk and adjudicator in the classification of cases based on their nature, the nature of the dispute, provides legal advice and assistance, especially for women, and the delivery of legal awareness sessions. Now, the ADR centers do not operate in a vacuum. Uh, as I said, the sources of law are here and Sharia, but there are also standard operating procedures which do not affect the customary nature of the disputes. They just provide some guidance when it comes to procedures to follow. Um, the Code of Conduct for the Adjudicators, GBV referral protocols, we'll speak in more details about this in a moment, and also child right and protection SOPs. Now, moving to legal aid, uh, let me explain before we move to the actual best practices how this works for the ADR centers. So when a person comes to the ADR center in search of assistance, the case is recorded by the clerk, and the person is then sent to the paralegal that is stationed at the center who provides legal advice. The paralegal is supported by a center lawyer who provides more in-depth legal advice and if needed also legal representation. And finally, the center works with some community-based paralegals who serve a double function. They do awareness raising, but they also help the population navigate the justice system. So basically some legal advice. And for those who cannot reach physically the ADR center, there are also justice calling services but are offered by the ADR centers paralegals. So let's move to the next slide and let's start with the first best practice. Yes, um, so the first best, pra best practice that we want to showcase is the possibility of using the ADR centers as a referral point, um, if you want to call it a service aggregation hub for survivors of gender-based violence. Now, as you know, international standards tell us that handling GBV cases through CIJ mechanism, mechanisms is not really advisable. However, our approach and our idea, and this is also the idea of the government, of course, is that the ADR centers are an innovative and people-centered and very pragmatic approach, which aims to ensure that in these cases, referral mechanism to formal justice and support services are actually operational. The point is that in certain locations, there are basically no formal justice institutions active. And of course, if there are no services there, justice delayed or justice actually in this case inaccessible is it means justice denied so the CIJ mechanism can really work in this case as a bridge not only to courts and police offices but also to hospitals shelters psychosocial service providers and the other complementary service providers now how it works concretely is that paralegal stationed at the ADR centers provide survivors of GBV with advice on how to open criminal cases with the police. And when necessary, uh, the paralegals or some CSOs partnering with the centers ensure the referral of GBV survivors by physically accompanying the person to the courts, to the police, uh, to the hospital, to the shelter, and basically guaranteeing that they get the medical and legal assistance that they need. And in these cases, all related costs are actually covered by the ADR Center. And finally, an additional service that has recently been added to uh, in Somalia, and in this case for now only in Somaliland, is forensic testing. Uh, the idea, again, is that the ADR centers can work as a bridge here, especially for cases of sexual violence, uh, where it's really essential, as you know, to gather the evidence, since otherwise prosecutors would have to rely on witness testimony. And in this case, in cases of sexual assault, eyewitness is basically the survivor and the accused. So it's not really easy to produce the evidence re required by the court. Let's move to the next uh, best practice that we want to showcase. So um, what we would like to highlight here is the establishment of mobile ADR centers. Again, you can find it in the compilation of best practices to reach what we defined in the previous webinar that, that we did together about a year ago, hard to reach populations. And this in the case of Somalia means nomadic communities or groups that are affected, for instance, by climate change, uh, such as IDPs. And for this, before speaking about this best practice, I just wanted to say a few words about how Somalia is affected by, by climate change and how this is leading then to conflicts that require the intervention of the ADR centers and of legal aid providers. So, of course, Somalia is highly susceptible and, and the effect manifests in extreme weather conditions. There are recurrent droughts, floodings that are that are caused or intensified by climate change, which are 
have resulted in an increased internal displacement, which often translates into flow of migrants from the countryside to urban centers. And these migration patterns trigger disputes that are very frequent between IDPs and permanent inhabitants. At the same time, climate change is also disrupting traditional ways of living, and it's intensifying the likelihood of conflict between farmers and pastoralists. And everything is basically happening because of competition over access to, to water, natural resources. What, what happens in practical terms is that water access points and the surrounding areas are often enclosed by pastoralists, and at the same time also farmers establish enclosure for the production of crops, which effectively block herders' access to water. Now, it is in this context that with IDLO with, has been supporting the, the Somali government to establish these mobile ADR centers. Now, differently from the physical ADR centers, which operate in a specific location throughout the year, mobile ADR centers are deployed based on geographic hotspots of insecurity, including those caused by, by climate change. And here I can see, for instance, an immediate cooperation between development agencies like IDLO and humanitarian agencies, since the mobile hotspots in the case of Somaliland are developed together with the National Preparedness Authority, and humanitarian agencies are often working with these authorities to actually support and strengthen its capacity. Um, the services offered by the mobile ADR centers are comparable to those of the physical centers, so I'm not going to delve into those. But the advantage is that these mobile ADR centers are stationed in hard-to-reach areas, which really make them an ideal platform for awareness-raising activities. So let's move to the last slide, um, and I'll try to... In to... one more minute. One? <laughs> Can two. I get two? <laughs> two, two. Thank you. Sorry, I have Stefano. Just... I know I have just one slide, but I think this is really one of the most interesting slides because it's how to promote uh, inclusiveness uh, through the ADR centers. Now, um, one of the critiques that is often used against CIJ systems is that they tend to discriminate women and vulnerable groups. And this is true in some cases, but I would say, and, and this is actually, this echoes a recommendation of the Diverse Pathways to People Centered Justice Report. You will find it in the last slide. This affects also formal justice institutions. So to try and overcome this situation, and, and then I promise I will close the intervention, uh, allow me to just mention in a few words how the ADR centers are trying to promote inclusion of women, IDPs, minority clans, and youth, while also protecting the rights of children. Now, for women, we already spoke about how to protect the rights of GBV survivors, but the ADR centers are doing more. They're trying also to promote the role of women in the justice sector in a context like Somalia, where the participation of women is often very limited. Now, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, clearly indicate that there needs to be equal representation of bo both men and women, and that a female adjudicator needs to be there each time there is a case of domestic violence, gender-based violence, or violence against children. Now, initially, male adjudicators were resisting towards the presence of women in the ADR centers, but gradually they started to understand the benefit. The benefit is that when there is a woman as an adjudicator, as a paralegal, as a clerk, uh, women justice seekers will much more easily open up, will much more easily share, will much more easily reveal family-related issues or display physical injuries. And as a result now, more than 20% of women adjudicate, of adjudicators in the ADR centers are women, and at least two women are included in each ADR centers. Few words on youth. Of course, age is important uh, for um, to actually appoint an adjudicator and to ensure the acceptance of the decision. But youth are actively participating in the ADR centers. The majority of the clerks, the paralegals, are actually young people. And this is somehow closing the generational gaps. Minority clans, representation is, is guaranteed by ensuring that different clans are represented in the adjudication panels. And a recent assessment showcased that 72% of the respondents, even if they were not aware of their clan representation in the adjudication panel, they still thought that this did not affect the verdict. IDPs, we already spoke about it. I'm running out of time, so I'll jump to the last point, which is how the ADR centers can better protect the rights of children. Now, in Somalia, cases involving children are mainly family dispute and petty crimes. Here we're speaking about injuries, fights, petty thieves. And for the former, so for family disputes, 
the strict application of customary law often implies that the best interest of the child can be disregarded, since the focus is on harmony within the community. As for petty crimes, and you will see there are anecdotal evidence everywhere, uh, children are often held for extended period of pretrial detention for really something as stealing a chicken. And in this context, the ADR centers develop these specific SOPs for children, which introduce the rule that all decisions concerning a child must consider what is in the child's best interest. And, and finally, and this is my final point, the ADR centers are also following a very pragmatic approach to try and promote a full referral mechanism. The problem with the referral mechanism when we speak about CIJ actors is that normally we focus on one side, so referring cases from CIJ actors to formal justice institutions, but not the other way around. What here is happening instead is that the ADR adjudicators go on a weekly basis to police stations to identify cases that can be referred to the ADR centers, who are basically acting at this point as a restorative and rehabilitative justice mechanism, which tries to avoid the criminalization of children. I'll stop there. I think I took three minutes, but thank you very much and happy to answer any question. And Stefano, I appreciate so much because this is so interesting and we could, uh, you know, I know we have dedicated actually a webinar to this, to this topic and I'll invite if colleagues can put actually the link to that in the chat because um, if, if they can find it, then the, that, that, that's another resource where we had a chance to discuss much more because it is such an interesting area of work. And I think you have also answered one of the questions in the Q&A, which really looked at uh, how we can strengthen the inclusion of marginalized groups. So thanks for that too, uh, Stefano. And um, with this, uh, last but not least, although we are really running out of time, we will hear from Katrin Staru, who's the head of global protection at the Danish Refugee Council. And Katrin, for you, uh, thanks so much for being with us today. Um, we know, as we said, that the task team, of course, had this big uh, emphasis on the development of these uh, legal aid analysis tools. And DLC has been a very active member, of course, both in the development of the tools, but also in the use and implementation. So could you, uh, we'd love to hear from you a little bit more around uh, the efforts of DRC around legal research and legal analysis to advance rights in humanitarian settings before Thanks. we bring it to a close. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Martina, and I'll try to be brief, but wanting exactly to share this opportunity to share some good practices and lessons learned on, on legal analysis and, and the whole recognition of the importance of evidence to inform and, and to upon which we base our legal aid and access to justice interventions in humanitarian settings. So legal analysis is really the, the needed foundation of, that guides our legal aid work and, and uh, ensures and facilitates, enables quality uh, protection outcomes to meet the legal aid needs of affected people. Um, it is really about understanding here and here you see the core elements and components, pillars of the legal analysis and the LAF as we do it. And because legal analysis is so essential, having that evidence based, this is exactly why we chose in the task team on law and policy, this specific group dedicated our time and work on, on legal aid and strengthening that in humanitarian settings. This is why we came together to develop this LAF, as we call it now, the legal aid analysis uh, framework to have that tool, to have that framework. So as you see here, it's a very uh, simple logic structured uh, framework that comprises of these four uh, components that I hope are pretty uh, self-evident. And I wanted to draw out a couple of points here in terms of uh, coming back to what other speakers have mentioned. So the importance that we put to starting our legal analysis, not jumping directly into the legal aid needs and but starting with that more broader look and understanding the context, understanding the legal aid and justice context, understanding, identifying actors, norms, policies, frameworks, the contextual factors basically that can both enable but also deter solutions to the legal aid needs. And then naturally, logically moving to the legal aid needs. And again here, understanding, identifying them, categorizing them, understanding the scope and who is impacted, but also importantly, the origin of the legal aid needs. And coming back to Catherine's point earlier about enabling us to address root causes once we also dig deeper and understand the, the origin of these legal aid needs. And then moving onwards to 
understand what is indeed the impact of these legal aid needs on the safety, the dignity, and the well-being of affected people. And again, with due consideration to different types of affected people, different groups, different at-risk marginalized uh, individuals and groups. And then lastly, and really importantly, not forgetting about the existing capacities and responses. So really doing that due diligence, so to speak, understanding, assessing what is already happening, who are the actors, what are the interventions, the efforts in terms of addressing, what are the capacities to address legal aid needs. There might also be barriers, which are super important for us to understand. And it all speaks about uh, to the, the importance of coordination and complementarity in, in this uh, work. I wanted to come to uh, the importance and the benefits we've seen from developing this LAF as a framework, as a tool. It's an analytical framework which has provided that much needed, well-structured, deliberate approach to doing our legal analysis. It provides a logic, I believe. It builds upon existing legal aid uh, analysis templates and, uh, and approaches and framework from all of us as, as organizations and agencies. And it builds and mirrors completely what has also been mentioned, the PATH, the Protection Analytical Framework, which is very well known to protection colleagues. So thereby also something that is recognizable and having that authority of a recognized, a commonly ac uh, agreed upon framework is just such a strength with the same language, the same terminology, the same components that we use, which greatly facilitates uh, joint analysis, but also the sharing and the use of each other's uh, analysis. So that hit whole interoperability between the, the efforts that we have. I also want to come back to a point that the Kurita mentioned, which has also been a very clear goal for us in putting that emphasis on legal analysis and having this tool uh, with us to develop further our legal analysis, because it's helped us already now to put more attention to legal aid in humanitarian context and legal aid and its essence and importance in terms of being an integral part of our uh, humanitarian response. So bringing that attention to legal aid needs bringing that attention to the importance of understanding and knowing what legal frameworks are there and so forth. I wish to share three very brief, I promise, <laughs> examples from Libya, Tunisia, and uh, from Latin America. So in Libya and Tunisia, we've had some interesting efforts going on. And this, these are two contexts where the traditional humanitarian coordination structures are not there. We have something else. And there we have actually used the whole effort on doing legal analysis and using the LAF as a coordination mechanism, I would even say. Uh, so in Libya, for example, we've had many reports over time on, on uh, legal challenges, but not really detailing uh, these legal aid needs arising from these legal challenges, also not detailing the gaps in legal aid provision. So coming around, and in, in Libya, we came together, DSC, NRC, and IRC, so it's also about how we use that effort uh, using the LAF and testing the LAF for our legal analysis, coming together in complementarity and coordination around this and pooling our expertise and knowledge and resources together with other partners. So that was really what facilitated the very coordinated uh, approach in Libya. In Tunisia, we uh, used it uh, to pilot the LAF and, and here for us, DLC, it was more about starting up. In Libya, where it was existing legal aid work that we wanted to further expand and, 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 and strengthen. In, in Tunisia, it was about stay, uh, starting more from uh, the start. But again, because of the lack of coordination mechanisms, we used this whole process, bringing in and engaging with government, with institutions, with national and international NGOs. In Latin America, we did a regional legal analysis. And here again, using the LAF uh, as a tool and as a framework, and to that systematic categorization and, and, and process of analyzing. It's been uh, incredible, helpful. And in, in Latin America, this legal uh, regional legal analysis has been shared in coordination forums in the region and way beyond with partners, with key stakeholders. And it's really and continues to be used to inform response programming and also the broader legal environment building, as we call it, including advocacy and so forth. 
So let me finish summarizing <laughs> a little bit, a few points on, on the benefits uh, of, of using the LAF and, and, and that product that we have actually delivered from this group in, in this uh, joint efforts we've had over the, the past years. We have seen that the LAF as a tool can be used in both humanitarian as it was developed for, but certainly also across the nexus. There we go again. Uh, in also development and, and peace building context, uh, we, we know the legal aid needs are there and it's not only confined to humanitarian crisis settings, but indeed beyond. We've also seen, and it is like that with tools and frameworks, it needs, you know, requires dedicated resources, time and capacity to make the best use of the LAF for, for our legal analysis. So it, it does, I mean, that was also the case in Latin America, it does require dedicated time and resources. All, and in Libya and in Tunisia, we also saw the sensitivities of the context including the sensitivities of the right and legal uh, status and stay of, of the groups affected people we are working with, meant a lot of, uh, of uh, challenges and, and thereby also the time to set aside uh, to, to do that legal analysis. In conclusion, I, I think and believe that these examples illustrate that the use of uh, the LAF in, in, in Libya, Tunisia, and also in Latin America as a foundation for our legal analysis uh, and, and thereby for our legal aid work and access to justice interventions really illustrates how that has facilitated coordination and partnership in legal aid efforts. We used it as a the whole process, as a, a process of coming together in a more coordinated and, and structured manner. And we used it very importantly to build that strong evidence base. And with that, with the opportunity to further expand and strengthen the scope of our legal aid and access to justice intervention. And importantly, and I want to finish on that, which is the most important point, it facilitated also much further knowledge and information and understanding of how we can access better and more uh, affected people, including hard to reach populations in a more efficient and effective manner. Thank you very much. And I have left, there is, I'll, I'll leave in the chat, there is the, the link to this regional legal analysis from Latin America. Thanks a lot, Martina. Back to you. It, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Catherine. And uh, I know it's been a, a bit of a rush and I know that we have uh, run out of time. We did not have the chance to answer to all the questions. In uh, We even had an additional Mentimeter question for all of you looking forward at the next steps. But perhaps... What I can say from here uh, really is, first of all, that it was such a pleasure to be with all of you to learn from our uh, speakers that we really want to thank because we've learned so much from all of you today. And this has been very helpful and we will share the material and your presentations in the page for the event. Um, we also want to really say that in terms of next steps, Donc, the work of the task force in this dire. area continues. So please reach out if you want to, uh, if you want to discuss the situation, if you want any support, or if you want to learn more about what we do and how we can help. Um, also just wanted to flag that we have in our webinar series, we have another webinar which is coming up actually in one week, uh, like on the 20th of November. And this one, it will actually look at cross-border legal aid issues. So it will be organized jointly with UNHCR and the task team on law and policy. Um, and uh, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I would really say uh, with this, uh, as we are a little bit out of time, I thank you once again to our speakers, uh, to all of you that have uh, stayed until the end with us uh, for this important event. And, and I hope that we can all keep working, you know, collectively uh, and uh, in these important areas and continue our joint learning and efforts uh, to strengthen legal aid and access to justice in humanitarian settings. So thanks again, uh, everyone, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>